On to our next issue. Um, I still read magazines. I like magazines and I like the hard copies of magazines. I like having them lying around the house and not having to turn my phone on and be able to turn a page. And North and South magazine's been around for a while and I think it covers some interesting issues. One, well, its cover issue, um, its latest edition, is free speech or freedom of speech. Um, the cover of North and South says, you can't say that or can you? Question mark. And inside, I think, is a really good piece called Voice Control, written by longtime journalist uh, and long firm journalist, uh, form journalist Yvonne Van Dongen. I particularly like the piece because I'm in it. Um, so it's got some absolute pearls and worlds of wisdom. But it looks across the whole issue of free speech, the culture wars, cancel culture, deplatforming, and the like. And I think it's a very good piece. And I recommend to you that you read it. Now, just before we get into the interview with Yvonne, though, I did have one problem with the piece, and this was not Yvonne's problem. The sub-editors put in comments about a tweet that I made in 2017, a deliberately ambiguous tweet about Harvey Weinstein. And I tweeted in 2017, just as the storm was breaking over Harvey Weinstein in the first couple of days, I said, anyone else feeling for Harvey Weinstein? I didn't say what I was feeling or say I was actually feeling or anything. I asked a question of other people about what they were feeling. And it provoked a Twitter storm and pile on, um, just making that comment. And the left-wing trolls went nuts. Um, that tweet was referenced by North and South magazine, who unfortunately did not accurately report the tweet. They said, I'd said anyone else feeling sorry for Harvey Weinstein therefore implying that I had sympathy for a man who's being accused of serious sexual misconduct, which of course I did not. I am happy to say North and South very, very quickly issued a public apology and they will have a full correction in the next uh, issue of their magazine. And I thank them for that. So that means that clears the way and clears the decks for me to talk to the author of this excellent piece on free speech, uh, Yvonne Van Dongen. Uh, Yvonne, welcome to the platform. Nice to have you with us. Lovely to be here, Sean, and thanks for pointing out that I did not make that addition. Yeah. That, yeah, that, I really appreciate that. But it oh. was, that was part of the issue with the story. It is a very, if in some circles, talking about free speech is a very controversial thing to do. So a number of the younger, woke staff were concerned about the story and had their hands all over it. But to the, audit, the editor's credit, she did run it. Yeah. Make it, well, look, uh, let's, let, look, let's cut straight to the chase then, because I think it is, and I love the headline, you can't say that or can you, question mark, uh, on North yep. and South. Talking yep. about free speech and freedom of speech is really important to protecting freedom of speech, if one believes, as I do, that it's a cornerstone of a good functional society. But it's really interesting that in your actual life as a journalist, you found doing a piece about freedom of speech really quite quite problematic, didn't you? I did. I did. I was really. I've been thinking about this issue quite a long time, actually. Probably because I thought I was on the side of the angels for a long time. You know, the left who are on the so-called right side of history. And then I found that I wasn't, and I thought, oh, it's not a very nice place to be. And so, what do you mean that you I weren't was, on the left, or you weren't oh, on the right? Well, no, I wasn't. There was issues. I support that suddenly we're not getting media traction and people were saying you're on the wrong side of history so i was thinking that i was quite so probably quite smug and complacent and hadn't thought about freedom of speech all that much but then once you do then you start you find that you have more in common with people you wouldn't normally have in common that's what i find quite interesting about the whole issue of free speech so the free speech union, some people dismiss them because it's got members of the taxpayers' union, it's got people who would, they'd be sort of leaning to the right. So if you're a lefty, you, you quickly dismiss it. You think, oh, no, they're, you know, they're not worth listening hey, Yvonne, to. are you saying you're a lefty or just a normal I journalist? To, I have been. And you're just a yes. normal journalist, so you're a bit left. That's just yeah, what being a journalist culpa, is. Yeah, mea culpa, mea culpa. Yeah, yeah. But, you, you know, when you get to my age, you've been involved in, you know, the apartheid marches and the gay rights and the environmental issues. So everything you've stood for, you think, well, you know, I'm you're always right. But then other issues come along and you think, oh, no, the world's changed and suddenly I'm on the outer. Yeah, so it, it's, it just made me think about it more often and more deeply. And that's why I interviewed Flynn years ago before he died, which mm. was very good. Jim Flynn, um, yeah. And, yeah, Jim Flynn. And so he 
who is a you know died in the wall lefty who was actually speaking out against censorship in universities so uh, yeah there, there it's a difficult story to write well difficult if you're from certain quarters because people don't like who you're talking to yeah, it's interesting yeah uh yvonne I would, and as someone, I guess, and you did come and talk to me, and I, I was flattered that you yep. did for this piece, and I have seen this and watched this evolve. Yeah. Firstly, I would say that those who engage in cancel culture are the first to say there is no such thing. It does not exist. Deplatforming and cancel culture aren't a real thing. Can you tell us from the research you've done, the people that talk to, is it a real thing or not? It is a real thing. It is a real thing. You don't think it's a real thing until people you're involved with, views you share, are cancelled. And that's the problem with free speech. You do have to be prepared to listen to views you don't much like. That might even be offensive. That might even be hurtful. It's not a crash. It's not, you know, we're not all <laughs> massaging one another's feelings. So that is the, the difficulty with free speech. It's unpleasant. It's uncomfortable. It can be offensive. And we have to get used to that idea. But now, in a world where it seems to me feelings are prioritised over facts, then as soon as you say you're hurt, everybody, you know, is reeling. Oh, no, can't be hurt, can't be hurt. Well, that's just life, I'm afraid. And I actually think most New Zealanders know that. I think most New Zealanders share these views. But it's the people who make the news and do Twitter are from a very narrow band. And so, I, yeah, I think it's actually skewed skewed what we're talking about a lot of the time. Yvonne, I'm going to ask you directly, and whether or not you, you, you answer, and I would yeah. understand if you didn't, how yeah. much interference, once you'd done all the interviews, and you'd interviewed people like me for this piece in North yeah. and South, how much interference did you, you face in post-production, and what was the attitude towards, and I'm going to say it, people like me who were being quoted, or who you had interviewed in, in the article? Okay, so the editor wasn't a problem, not at all, but there were younger staff members and people who saw it, so on contract, she, she handed it around to some other people for feedback. And they come from the woke corner of the world, and they then wanted to, because people like you are not, you know, much liked. Uh, look, well, hang on, hang on, just back up the bus okay, here. Well, they, you know me, we had a really nice discussion. Yeah, we had a great yeah, yeah, I don't have any problem with you, Sean. So, but all. why do the... Who are these people who've got a problem with me? Well, there are things that you've said in the past and things or that you Or not said, that they've made not up said, that I said. stood up for, and you've had, you know, the complaints about... I think I mentioned at the um, broadcasting... Yeah, yeah. So you've one got, complaint. You've got form. You've got form in certain areas. Now, people who don't know you, they'll think, oh, that Sean is like this, or so-and-so is like that. That's the trouble. We don't, we don't actually engage with people as individuals. We you know slam them as members of a tribe and so they came back with the copy came back with oh i can't tell you how many questions which were and a lot of them would they wanted to add gotchas oh did you know x this person was associated with this thing you know so they just wanted to to besmirch people's character because they had been associated with campaigns or actions in the past that the younger people didn't like it was actually yeah it was really a woke reaction to the story which was quite shocking. But as I say, at least the editor, she removed most of them and she did run the story. There was a time there I thought it wasn't going to be run. Yeah. And at one point, she did say that she'd get someone else to rewrite it. And then I said, look, don't pay me. Don't pay me. I stand by my work. I'm not, you know, I don't want it rewritten. Because I've had that before. Mm. I had it before with a listener. So I thought, I never, I'm not going to go there again. So, you know, it's getting harder and harder to write some stories, which is why probably I am so interested in this article mm. or in this topic. Well, well, I think given, you know, uh, given the head when you face, it's still a very good piece and I would recommend it highly to anyone, Yvonne. But, but let's go back to that thing. So yep. there is a culture war going on. Yes, I think there is. Absolutely, definitely. And yeah. cancel culture, whether it be a coordinated campaign, is a thing. People yep. who say things which are not regarded as politically correct yep. can face social isolation, media isolation and criticism Absolutely. pretty fast. Absolutely. 
Yep, yeah. yep, yep. And mostly, it's funny, you know, when it's not happening to your group, you ignore it. You think, oh, well, yeah, so what? You know, Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux can't speak at a council venue. Oh, well, who cares? And then you think, oh, well, Don Brash, have I ever really liked him? No. So he can't speak at the university. Who cares? But then it happens to one a group that you want to listen to, and suddenly it's like, oh, that's not fair. So that was a real wake-up call for me. I thought, I've can't be complacent about these things and um, the voices of offensive people matter as much as the voices of the people I value so it, it really has been an education for me and I think a lot of people have to think about that because that is the bedrock of free speech listening to people you don't much like yeah. and engaging with them and I think the problem with the, with the way we are talking now maybe to do with social media or a whole other, lot of other reasons we are not listening to people we are not engaging we're not debating people and we really we, we're dismissing them we're saying you're lesser than and I'm not even going to listen to you but we really do have to talk to one another I think it's more critical than ever yeah yes. and, and that's what, Gluckman says, doesn't he? We, we are yeah. scared of difficult values-based conversations. You've spoken true. to so many people, but I tell you what, it would seem to me there is a preponderance of people who are subject to cancel culture or criticism by the woke left in your piece. You actually didn't get free speech engagement to the same level from those who practice cancel culture and from the left. What do you mean? I mean? You know, that's right. So they are not as enthusiastic about free speech. Well, free speech when it suits their values. That's what it comes down to, which I myself had been guilty of. So that's true. That's true. It's, that's what I'm saying. It has to be universal. Are you telling me, Yvonne, that you were a, a Graylin, Thornton, yes. dinner party, yes. liberal, learning yes. to rayo and doing the rest of it? No, I didn't. I did learn to rayo years ago. Yeah, actually. I knew. I picked it. I would have picked it that you would be one of them. I I'm so predictable. I'm such a walking cliche. However, I've been kicked out of the pot, so now I'm tri kind of tribeless, really, wandering around. And I think there are now more... Now, okay, let, let, let me ask you this. Yeah. Yvonne, I was... You know, I, I'm a pretty open person, and when you rang me and I thought, Yvonne, oh, I know, Yvonne, and I had slotted you, I'll be honest, I'd yeah. slotted you into the left-wing liberal Paula Penfold dinner party type, Right. Yep. Uh, we talked, we had a good discussion. I thought, yep. actually, my indication, my instinct was that you were going to be open. And I was then surprised and I felt like you were, if you like, falling out of the rabbit hole as time went on and we talked about this piece and, oh. and the issues you were having with it. Has yeah. the, have you lost friends? Has your so social circle changed as your journalistic sensibilities have altered on an issue like this? Yeah, not on this particular issue, although it may, I don't know, but I've only had good feedback from friends on this issue. But I have been, I got into the gender critical area. And when I say gender critical, I think most New Zealanders are gender critical because yep. they believe in women's rights and you believe in science. So mm. that, that is gender critical, basically. And so once I started to just, I stupidly posted a few things on Facebook about those issues and suddenly there you know, pile on. And then those were groups that I was aligned with, like Auckland Women's Centre, and if anybody said something that was vaguely gender critical, they were dumped on. And so then I thought, I didn't really want to engage. I don't want to do social media. I don't do Twitter. I don't want to get into social mm. media fights. So absolutely it has. And I've had friends who say to me, I don't want to talk to you about this issue. I don't want to talk to you. So absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Whether I've lost friends or people are now more wary or, yeah, no doubt. No doubt about it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Yvonne, the other thing, and I think wider to what you've written about, yep. um, and, and we've got the Prime Minister over at the UN talking about the Christchurch call, and I've described yeah. today an issue we had, I think, with a very informative uh, interview we did yesterday on COVID, and we are finding that in social media... Decisions and censorous decisions are being made with very little recourse yeah. and very little understanding of how those decisions are made. And in fact, the Prime yeah. Minister through the Christchurch call is looking for an international level of censorship across social media where certain things become, become unacceptable to, to say. That would right. seem to be, to be the formalisation and the global formalisation of an anti-free speech movement? Yeah, I mean, we don't want videos of massacres going no. out. 
we there are there has to, there's limits to free speech and and you know yeah. publications all sorts of things, but so we have to be very careful. And I think that was also the problem with the hate speech laws in New Zealand, which I haven't looked at in depth. But we have to be very very careful when we start to censor exactly what it is we're doing, and everybody has to be engaged with that debate because. The best of intentions can have the worst outcomes. Mm. So, yeah, that, that is something that should be examined carefully because there is a case for certain things to be legislated against, but that, as long as it doesn't get, take, get a whole lot of other issues that need to be discussed. Mm. So it is problematic. It's problematic, and that's why the hate speech laws have been shelved. Mm. Uh, do you think it's all over, though, Yvonne, or are they going to have another crack at that? I think they've shelved it till maybe they'll pick a more s suitable time. I don't think it's all over. No, I mm. think they might have another crack at it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they'll have another crack at it. Look, you've got, got, you've got your piece, yeah, you got your piece published in North and South. I think it's yeah. a good piece, despite the troubles you had. Could yeah. I ask you, is there anything you didn't get to say in that article, any point you didn't get to make, and I give you the opportunity to make it oh. or say it now? No, no, I th I pretty, pretty much everything I had in here was um, uh, the, pretty much everything in the story that I'd put in. There were some other additions that I didn't feel were necessary, but they liked the one about that you had. Mm. But however, no, it, I didn't have bits removed that were too um, controversial or no, not at all. So that's good, isn't it? I do mm. credit the editor for that. Yeah. It was just unfortunate but predictable because I think in a lot of media newsrooms now, they're people of a certain age, and I bet they all share the same views, which is part of the problem. I have We're to speak against that. My 23-year-old, 22, 23-year-old okay. producer was just in the studio because we'd just done a story on okay. how male enrolment in tertiary education is dropping, and I'd suggested to this academic we had on that that's because yeah. um, um, the woke environment of varsities isn't conducive to males, and he said, oh, no, no, that's not the case. I had my young producer who's just finishing his degree shaking his head and he came in and said, of course, sure, and that's why blokes don't like it at university because it's so bloody woke and it's so anti-bloke, um, which kind oh. of, once again, is connected back to what you write about. What are you working on now, Yvonne? What's the next big thing? Um, I am, well, I've actually got a short-term contract working for... <laughs> now I've been redeemed. Child Poverty Action Group. Yeah. Just, we're doing some work for them and, oh, I am, I have pitched a story. Um, there's two stories I want to write, so I can put it out there and see if anybody wants to take it. There's a chap called Michael Biggs, Professor Michael Biggs. Mm -hmm. He's at Uni Oxford University, Professor, Sociologist, and he's a Kiwi. Mm -hmm. And he was a key witness in the Tavistock case, the famous Tavistock case, which led to the closing. This is the gender reassignment clinic yeah, that has yeah, been shut down yeah. in Britain. Yeah. yeah, and his he was a key witness because his speciality is social movements, and he was looking at how the trans activist movement has become so successful in such a short period of time, mm. and that's how he became a key witness. But anyway, he's coming to New Zealand around Christmas, and I want to do a story on him about that. Why, how has the trans activist movement been so monumentally successful with such actually quite... Mind you, there's blowback uh, coming, though you yeah. will not read about Tavistock and mainstream media in New Zealand. That is no. one of those issues you're not yeah. allowed to talk about, right? In, in yeah, the MSM. Absolutely. But and another thing that's quite curious is that, is that our newsroom and then the listener published two pieces by two, I was they medical people anyway, one was a professor, one was a medical person, um, concerned about the medicalisation of trans teens and pointing out that the Ministry of Health advice says that they are, puberty blockers are safe and reversible. And in the last week, that has changed and they have changed their advice. They have removed the words safe and reversible. Now, I'm looking forward to seeing a story on that in mainstream media. Why has that happened? I'm hoping some journalist has put in an OIA request finding out what was the discussion about that. Because, yeah, we are, it's ridiculous, really. So these are stories that will not, don't make it into mainstream media. So I'm wanting to do a story on Michael Biggs. And if that doesn't work, then I'll do one on the um, changing advice from the Ministry of Health. Well, Yvonne, you have definitely taken the red pill, haven't you? I have. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lost cause, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, really good talking to you. And I would like to thank you also for the interview you did with me and the comments that you put in, in your article. I think they were fair and accurate and oh. reflected my views and my positions accurately and that is all we can ask from from our it's news true. media. 
And it's been really good for me from a personal point of view. I have had to engage with people I wouldn't normally engage with and give them value. I mean, they have got valid points. It's been a real eye-opener. So I think more pe- freedom of speech has got a lot to recommend it, actually, and we should start listening to one another. That is the important thing, mm. listening to one another and talking. So, yeah, thank you for talking to me, Sean. I really enjoyed our interview. It was fantastic. All right, we look forward to this other stuff, and I thank you for your time this morning. That is uh, journalist Yvonne Van Dongen. What a fascinating discussion about someone's journey from being in the Liberal Chardonnay um, pleasant, slightly soft left journalism world and realising that if you actually wanted to keep writing the truth, you were going to lose some friends, you weren't going to be as socially acceptable. Um, Really good.